be back. I was here, I think, back in the, uh, October, I think is the last time I was here. I always like coming over to Mobile. Uh, Mobile is, is a wonderful city, so any opportunity I have to come on over, I, I love to do that. Um, I always, uh, when I tell people, people ask me, you know, where, where am I from when I'm traveling, and I tell them, oh, like, you know, Pensacola, and they usually don't know where that's at, so then I'll say, like, you know, where Panama City or Destin is at, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, the panhandle, and I'll say yes, and they'll say, yeah, lower Alabama. That's, that's what we always get, and I always like to remind people that um, uh, while that is, you know, there's a lot of similarities culturally, socially, politically, definitely, in, in the Florida panhandle with, with uh, lower Alabama for sure, but Alabama was once part of West Florida and La Florida, and Florida was never part of Alabama. So I resent that <laughs> to some degree, but, but, but it is true. There are a lot of similarities, and I was, uh, I've given this talk a few different times, and so, uh, of course, I'm in Mobile, so I wanted to see you know, what kind of connections are there, and actually there are quite a few connections with this site that's way out uh, in the Apalachicola River, which is about, if you drive... Um, uh, east for about four hours from Pensacola, you'll eventually hit Apalachicola, and that's where it's at. But there are actually a lot of there are a lot of connections between this site way out in the Apalachicola River and Mo Mobile, Alabama. And we'll talk about some of that today. Um, as as you stated in the introduction, I do work for the University of West Florida. Uh, my my official title is I'm a faculty research associate, which basically means I get some of the benefits of being faculty, but I don't formally have to teach any classes, which is fantastic, because I don't want to grade any papers. But of course, we do help students a lot. I sit on a few different thesis committees. Uh, one of the students, one of the graduate students we have in our underwater archaeology program, which we're, o we're only a handful of universities in the country that offers a degree, both an undergraduate and a graduate program in specifically underwater archaeology, which people always ask, can I get a job in that? And the answer is, right now, they are dying for people. Yeah, because of the offshore wind farms. And archaeology has to be done out there before they put those out there. So there's lots of jobs available in underwater archaeology right now. Um, as for the Florida Public Archaeology Network, we're a statewide program of UWF, so we do a lot of talks like this. We do also do lots of other things. I have a couple different brochures and rack cards. Uh, about FPAN and what we do, and so if you're interested, I'm happy to give you that at the end of the night. But we also have a museum down in downtown Pensacola uh, that's free and open to the public, and it shows you all the cool archaeology we have, not just in downtown Pensacola, but throughout the entire state, both on land and underwater. So I encourage you to come on out and visit if you're ever down in Pensacola. <laughs> Tonight's talk I call the Maroon Marines uh, Archaeology at Prospect Bluff. I would argue, um, and many scholars also argue that this is one of the most important sites, uh, not just in Florida, but for the entire United States. And the reason why it's one of the most important archaeological sites and historic sites is because it is the location of what was once the largest free black settlement in the continental United States. It wasn't the earliest, uh, but it was the biggest by far. And it was, uh, only existed for about two years. And we'll talk about the context of why it was created and what happened to these people and some of the archaeology that has been done at that site since, uh, by professional archaeologists anyway, since the 1950s. Okay, um, one of the students that I do, I mentioned I sit on graduate thesis committees. One of our students, Bria Brooks, uh, her um, plan is to do some work out at Apalachicola at this site. So uh, there's, there's ongoing research, so it's changing all the time, as is the case with archaeology done everywhere. Um, so hopefully uh, there will be some updates about this site and what they are able to find out uh, over the next few years as, uh, as our graduate student does some more work out there. I wanted to start this talk acknowledging uh, this woman right here, Dr. Rosalind Howard. She was a professor of anthropology at the University of Central Florida. We would not know the amount of information about this site and about the living descendants uh, of Prospect Bluff if it had not been for um, Dr. Howard's work. Uh, unfortunately, she, had, she actually passed away uh, earlier this year. Um, but I encourage everybody after this talk, if you're interested, please go read her books. A lot of the information that I'm going to tell you tonight came from her work, not just the articles that we wrote. She, has, she actually has a few different books that she also wrote uh, about, about her work about this site. Um, I was never able to 
actually meet Dr. Howard. I actually, most of the books that have been written about this site, the major works anyways, I either know, have studied under, uh, or uh, have met all the people that have written the books about this place. But I never had the pleasure of uh, meeting her. But I just wanted to acknowledge uh, th the incredibly important role that she has played in understanding not just this site, uh, but freedom seekers throughout the Gulf South. Okay. So one of the things we'll talk about tonight is archaeology. And uh, a lot of times when we give talks about archaeology, people often will ask us, you know, what kind of rocks we study or what kind of fossils? And the answer is, we don't study rocks or fossils. Uh, archaeologists uh, are uh, anthropologists. We're actually trained as anthropologists in the United States. But archaeology, just to kind of give a very, very basic um, definition, is a study of human culture through their material remains. And so we study people that lived in the past based on the things they left behind. And we call those things that they made and used, we call those artifacts. And so archaeologists study artifacts, that material culture that was left behind. And that's what archaeologists are able to do uh, for places like the site we'll talk about tonight, Prospect Bluff. Archaeology is very important uh, because, you know, of course, even about this site, we have tons of historical records and documents. I'll actually show you several of the records that actually exist, many of which have been digitized and are online. Some, some are in special collections uh, that you'd have to physically go and visit. Um, but we have tons of information from the historical documents about this place. But the people who actually lived there, who were formerly enslaved, who became Marines in the British Colonial Corps, they did not leave behind a written record. We, we don't have a firsthand account from those individuals. All we're left with is documents mostly from governments who did not want that community to exist. And that is inherently the problem with historical records is there's always going to be bias within those records and documents. So while we have a, a massive amount of information, it's coming from different perspectives and sides that are not the people that actually live there. So that's where archaeology can play a very important role is to help tease that story out from the people who actually lived at these places who did not leave behind a written record. And in many cases, the reason for that was because they weren't allowed to read and write because it was made illegal. And in some cases, they weren't allowed to testify in court because of their enslavement status. Right? So archaeology can really help us understand these histories of people who weren't necessarily fortunate enough to leave behind a written record. All right, so I had this question earlier. Where is the site on Prospect Bluff? OK, so this is a map of Florida. Here's Mobile Bay up here. Pensacola's kind of over here. You go. If you go down I-10, which is like there, travel about three and a half, four hours, then you go south, and it's going to put you in this area. This is called, this is known as the Big Bend. Sometimes we call it the Forgotten Coast. People always forget about us, especially if you're in uh, east of Tallahassee, they forget about us sometimes. Uh, but so it's, it's approximately about 60 miles south of Chattahoochee, and Chattahoochee is a little community that's on the confluence of the Chattahoochee River way up there on the state line with the border. And then, so it's 60 miles south, right there on the Apalachicola River. So this is the site of Prospect Bluff. This is uh, Apalachicola Bay down here. And the river's right up here. This river is incredibly important for West Florida. It's the only river in West Florida that goes all the way up into Georgia and actually uh, goes up into Columbus, Georgia. So strategically, it has always been very important strategically. Uh, economically, it's been really important. Um, I know if you, if you walk through Golf Quest, it actually mentions Apalachicola as being one of the most important ports, one of the largest ports in the Gulf South uh, you know, in the, uh, after the, ante, in the antebellum period, so right before the American Civil War. So strategically, it's very important. But it's located currently in what is now the, uh, the Apalachicola National Forest. So it is managed uh, by the Department of Ag Agriculture. Is actually, isn't the forest? Yeah, they're the Forest Service's Department of Ag Agriculture. Um, this map was actually drawn uh, by a guy named Vincente Pintado. He was a royal map maker for the Spanish. And if you look right here, you'll see the river. And this was made in, uh, I believe, 1815 or 16. I think it's 1816 is when this map was drawn. Um, and you'll notice right here, this location, it says Lomo de Buenavista, which means uh, 
like a hill with a pretty view is it's basically it's translation to Spanish. And then underneath it it says O, which means or, and then this is its indigenous name, which I probably can't pronounce at all, but I'm gonna make a bad attempt at doing it. It was known as uh, Akchawatli. Now I've asked um, some indigenous speakers of the uh, uh, Miccosukee and Muscogee, those are the languages of the Seminole Miccosukee and the uh, Muscogee or Creek people. And uh, there's a great language program with the Muscogee Nation in Oklahoma where they actually are trying to teach their uh, younger generations the Muscogee language. And so I reached out to them and I reached out to a, 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 a gentleman I know with the Seminole Tribe of Florida and I asked them, you know, do you know what this means? And so far they've not been able to give me a, a, an answer. So if anybody knows, I, I'd love to know. And they, they gave me a couple reasons why that might be. And it might be just because language changes over time, might be older words that they just don't use anymore. Or it could have been a different language because we know there were many indigenous people that, that lived in this area um, that were part of that larger kind of Muscogean language family. It's also the site um, here of Prospect Bluff. Uh, it was the site of in 1804, there was a large concession of land, millions of acres. It was known as the Forbes Purchase. There was a company called Panton Leslie and Company. They actually had a headquarters here in Mobile. They had a headquarters in Pensacola as well. Later became known as John Forbes Company. And uh, one of the things that they were mainly doing is they were trading with the indigenous groups in the South. And a lot of the times what they would do is they would basically get these tribal groups indebted to them. So, you know, pay me later kind of scheme. And eventually the, the debt got so massive that the only way that the tribes could pay this off was through land concessions. And that's essentially what happens with the Ford purchase, the, the Miccosukee, the Seminole, the Muscogee, the Yuchi people who are living in this, the, this area had to concede millions of acres of land in 1804. And the site where they signed this treaty at to do that agri agreement was at Prospect Bluff. And part of the reason for that is the John Forbes Company actually had a, a trading post located here on this bluff in 1804-1805. Um, but moving them forward in time, so we, we know that what the Spanish called it. Uh, we know indigenous people were using that area. Um, we know it was once the location of the John Forbes Company or earlier than that, Panton Leslie and Company, one of their trading warehouses. So we, we know all that. But later on, it becomes this, the largest free black settlement in the continent of the United States. And so why, why and how did that happen? And so to do that, to answer that, we have to bring some context into this. So these people were known as Maroons. And Maroons were formerly enslaved people of African descent who freed themselves. Usually it was done through forcible measures. They armed themselves and they literally f forced their enslavers to free them by violent means. Sometimes it was also done by just literally, you know, running away, right? So there's a lot of ads during this time period of runaway slaves that is a historical term that they use for them. Uh, now most historians, we like to use uh, freedom seekers. Instead of calling them runaway slaves, we call them freedom seekers because it gives them more agency. They, they had agency. They were taking matters into their own hands. Um, we know that these maroon communities existed from the very beginning of colonization. This was not a new development in the 17 or 1800s. This existed from the very beginning, from the very moment that uh, African people were enslaved and then brought across the Atlantic from the transatlantic slave trade into these different colonies, they were resisting in many different ways, including by freeing themselves through both violent means and really through any way necessary. Um, this is an image of um, Nanny the Maroon and Leonard Parkinson, very famous Maroon communities that existed in Jamaica. Uh, what's really remarkable about these Maroon communities is that they actually forced the British government to sign treaties with them. I mean, and that's, that's how effective they could actually be. Um, so, again, they existed a long time. We also know most of these maroon communities were intermixed with the indigenous populations. That was also a very common thing. And we see the same thing happening at the site of Prospect Bluff in 1814 to 1816. And then many other maroon communities that it kept expanding south and to the east as they were trying to, uh, you know, flee the, the militaries trying to get rid of them. Okay, so, so they've been around a very long time.
For this context, really this community develops for two main things that are happening during this early 1800s. The first is the War of 1812. Uh, War of 1812, of course, is fought between the United States, Great Britain, and they all have different allies, including many indige different indigenous allies. But by, by the, the middle of the war, the British came up with a new strategy, and that was to open up a war in the Gulf South. And their plan basically called for, you know, they didn't have enough manpower to, to really open up another southern, a, a southern campaign, a, a Gulf South front. So instead, what they did is they wanted to ally with formerly enslaved people or offer freedom to enslaved people who would join the British as well as indigenous people who were alienated with, with the Americans and wanted to side with the British. And so that was their strategy, was to, to get the manpower through those Maroons, as well as those indigenous people, and then supply them, them with weaponry and uh, technical skills and knowledge and training. Okay, that's the plan. Why were they doing that? Well, they first, the plan was to take Pensacola, which was actually Sp a Spanish possession at the time. Florida was, uh, at the time was all Spanish territory. They wanted to take Pensacola, then they wanted to come to Mobile and take Mobile, and then from Mobile, once they had Mobile, they could then launch an attack on New Orleans. And so the prize was really to take New Orleans. And the reason why they wanted to take those different places is because they all had ports, right? So there was strategic importance for those, those maritime resources, but also being able to, up, to travel through those rivers of taking those locations. So that, that's what the plan called for. The other thing that was taking place that really allowed, that kind of resulted in the formation of this community was the Creek Civil, what's sometimes referred to as the Creek Civil War. The Creek Civil War is very, very complicated. Sometimes historians try to like boil things down. Um, and there's, there's always you know, kind of exceptions. But suffice it is to say that because of political, economic, social, even religious reasons, uh, people known as the Upper Creeks, which were typically mostly up in Alabama, and the Lower Creeks, who were mostly in Georgia, uh, eventually had a, a war. And basically, it kind of boiled down to the fact that most of the Upper Creeks were very concerned about losing land to all these uh, Anglo-American settlers that they saw encroaching in their territory. And they were also very concerned about losing their traditional lifeways. Whereas the Lower Creeks were closer to the British traders and they, they were more open to things like what we would sometimes refer to as uh, creolization or a symbolization of cultures. Ultimately, that resulted in a very bloody conflict that took place during the same time as the War of 1812. Why, is, why does this matter? Well, it matters for the, both the British and Americans because both of those different powers then had allies from two indigenous groups, right? The British mostly through the upper creeks and the Americans mostly through the, the lower creeks. So these two factors really um, helped create the conditions for this community to form and really thrive for a couple years. I talked about freedom seekers. Um, during the War of 1812, uh, Alexander, Admiral Alexander Cochran and a guy named Colonel Edward Nichols, uh, they were the, really the, the ones that implement this plan. So Alexander Cochran issued this proclamation that basically said to anybody who is enslaved in the United States, if you join British forces, you will be free. You will be granted your freedom. The result of that was the formation of the Corps of Colonial Marines and that was really the job of Colonel Edward Nichols. And so Cochran kind of came up with this strategy and this plan. Edward Nichols was the guy who needed to actually implement it. So they created this Corps of Colonial Marines. And after they issued this proclamation, thousands of formerly enslaved people freed themselves. And they joined the Corps of Colonial Marines. They joined the Marines, the British Marines. This is Edward Nichols. He's the one who trained these Marines. Um, Edward Nichols was an ardent abolitionist. He hated slavery. He hated the slave trade. He hated it throughout his entire life. Uh, he joined the um, Royal Marines. He was actually Irish. He joined the Marines when he was like a kid, when he was like 11 years old. He goes on through his military career to fight in 107 engagements. He's wounded 24 times in his career. He's shot. He's bayoneted. He's cut by a saber on the head. Uh, he goes through all these, he loses 
his, one of his eyes he actually loses in combat. So his nickname, not surprisingly, was Fighting Nichols. He was a fighting Irishman. So uh, he was in a very good position to really train soldiers. He understood battle and warfare very well. And so that's why he was selected for this. Um, so in 1814, they issue out this proclamation. They get hundreds and hundreds of people coming in from, from different states in the United States, but also in Indian ter territory, uh, as well as in Spanish territory. People are, are freeing themselves from their enslavers, and they're coming to this new post that Nichols constructed. He, he constructed one near Chattahoochee. It was called Nichols Outpost. And then further south, he built a much bigger one uh, called the British Post at that site of Prospect Bluff. And uh, by that time, he had actually gotten enough allies from those upper creeks to help build this fortification. And it was a massive fortification that they constructed. Um, so more and more people, formerly enslaved people, were now free, joining the Corps of Colonial Marines. And they had over 1,000 indigenous people from the upper creeks uh, coming in and building that fortification and manning it as well. If you look at closely on that map I showed you earlier, this is a close-up. It shows you um, the fortification at Prospect Bluff. Uh, you can see right here there's this V pattern that's known as a redon. It's, it's basically they would put, um, this is like a, a wooden wall that they would then put uh, artillery on the top of it so they could fire at boats coming up and down the Apalachicola River. Behind it, this octagonal shape uh, was probably the blockhouse. And it was also the location of uh, the powder magazine, which is where they kept all their gunpowder uh, for, for all their, their weapons, their cannons, and their small arms, things like that. And then the little um, squares is the, is the village that was all around it. OK, so it was, it was a very massive site. All right, so we talked a little bit of the context. Um, it's kind of leading up into it. Again, the plan was to eventually take New Orleans, but it's had to start with Pensacola. And it, in order to get to Pensacola, they needed to have a base of operations to train those Colonial Corps Marines. And that just happened to be at Prospect Bluff. Um, March 1814, the Creek Civil War comes to an end. There is the Battle at Horseshoe Bend, which is uh, uh, an American victory uh, and their Lower Creek Ally victory. The Upper Creek's warriors were decimated. They lost 800 uh, fighting men in that battle. It was, it was, a, it was a terrible consequences for, for the Muscogee people uh, after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Essentially what happens is you have now all the, the survivors are essentially refugees, uh, and they're looking, they're looking for safety. And where do they go? They go south. They go into Spanish Florida. They're trying to get away from the US forces, so they go into the Spanish, uh, Spanish Florida, Spanish territory. Around that same time, though, is when Prospect Bluff is starting to be constructed, is, is when you know, the proclamation goes out just right after that, April of 1814. So now there's an opportunity for all these refugees to go somewhere. So they're going south, and they're, they're also joining up with, with the British. Construction starts in May of, 18, uh, of 1814, that same year. So you see it's happening very, very quickly. Um, after they built the fortification, it's, you know, they had they built up enough forces and trained enough of those upper creeks uh, with the prophet Josiah Francis, who was the guy that basically leading these uh, upper creek warriors down uh, to join, the, join up with the British. He had amassed enough soldiers, and they had enough armaments now where they could then decide to go and take Pensacola. So that's exactly what they do. They, they take a large group, a large contingent from Prospect Bluff, and they go and they take Pensacola, basically to just walk right into the place in the Spanish Governor in charge just, just says, OK, take it. No, no problem. So they walk in. Because they, they were, the, the Spanish were also worried about the Americans coming into Spanish Florida. They were, they were also concerned. So they essentially let it happen. Um, so that happens in August. By September, they're ready to make their next move. And so they, they continue to train more and more of these formerly enslaved people that are coming all over the place. Many of them were uh, uh, forced into slavery by John Forbes and company. But also, many Spanish citizens, also some of their former, the people that they had formerly enslaved, they also found their freedom and joined the colonial corps. So it's just getting bigger and bigger. The army's amassing. But by September, they had enough forces that they decided, now it's time to take Mobile. And so the plan was basically they were going to take this little fort, fort right here, Fort, fort By Bauer, Boyer, Bauer, something like that. Uh, if, if you know where Fort Morgan's at, that's, that's essentially where this fortification was at. They just built them right on top of it. That, that Fort Morgan's a later 
fort, but they built right on top of this fort. Um, the plan was, okay, we got to take this fort because they have, to, they have to get into the bay, right? So they, they have to take the fort first. Um, so they send a contingent, and it's repulsed. It fails. So the, the assault fails, and they end up just going back to Pensacola. And there they just keep training and keep amassing more and more soldiers. Eventually, Andrew Jackson comes in, and he decides that he's going to take Pensacola because they know about this growing force of these maroon marines. They're very, very concerned. The American planners and slavers are very worried. They see an existential threat to the institution of slavery with the creation of this core of colonial marines. And so they wanted to stamp it out. And so Jackson, in November 1814, goes and tries to take Pensacola. The British know it's coming. They know they don't have enough forces to hold it. So the British essentially capitulate, but not before destroying one of the forts there, Fort uh, San Carlos. They blow it up. And then Nichols takes his forces back to Prospect Bluff. And then essentially there's, there's a small little battle between the Spanish and the Americans. There's a few casualties on both sides. Ultimately, the Spanish capitulates, and then Jackson takes Pensacola. And then shortly after that, um, the, of course, the Treaty of Ghent is signed uh, by December 1814, so the war is actually over already. And then the Battle of New Orleans eventually does happen, but it happens after the treaty is signed in January. But that is also an American victory. So the, the, the British plan of taking Mobile and New Orleans ultimately did not work out. And the war comes to an end. But now there's a problem for the, for, the, um, for the British, is they have this very large contingent of Corps of Colonial Marines now stationed in Prospect Bluff. They were very well armed and very well trained. And now it's, the question is, what, what do we do with all these people now? Because the Americans' intentions were very clear. They saw these people as property, and they wanted to return these people they saw as property to the people who enslaved them. And so the, the British, are, particularly Nichols, is, is caught in this really difficult situation. There are several leaders, though, that kind of come out of this that are now waiting to see what will happen at Prospect Bluff after the war ends. One is this guy. This is an uh, uh, artistic uh, rendering of what he may have looked like. Um, this is by Dave Edwards. He's an artist in Pensacola. Um, but this is of a man named Garçon. Uh, Garçon, we know, was 30 years old. He was uh, listed as a carpenter. And we know that his, his, his enslaver was a guy named Don Montero, who was a citizen in Pensacola. He joins the Corps of Colonial Marines when they, after they had taken uh, Pensacola. And he works his way up, and he becomes a sergeant in, in the Corps of Colonial Marines, in the Marines. So we know also from documents that it appears he's probably married. His, uh, his, we, we think his wife's name was Maria, and has probably had a child, too. Um, of course, we don't have the marriage record. Uh, but, but there is some circumstantial evidence to suggest that, that he had a wife and a child. So there, he's there with his family now at Prospect Bluff waiting. This is that prophet I mentioned. This is uh, Prophet Josiah Francis. He's, he's also now kind of waiting to see what will happen now that the war has ended. Uh, very, um, you know, obviously concerned about what's, what's going to come. This is another man that's also waiting. This guy's name is Abraham. Uh, Abraham, we, we know, was formerly enslaved by the John Forbes Company. We know he was a trained shipwright, so he built ships. And the John Forbes Company relied on ships for their deerskin trade, mostly. The, the coastal, coastal trade and the deerskins, they relied on boats. So it's very, very probable that Abraham knew this area very, very well because some of their enslaved people, like people like Abraham, uh, weren't just working, you know, tanning hides. I mean, he was out there negotiating deals. He was out there actually trading. He was building the ships. He was on the ships. He was very familiar with these river systems and the coast. So you had this very uh, deep knowledge of the environment, but also the landscape. And that comes into play uh, later on as, as things um, start to go south for them. 1815, basically what happened is the British pull out. Nichols is ordered to pull all his men out, but uh, you know, he's, he's, he's an officer in the Marines. He has to follow orders, but he leaves all the supplies, all the guns, all the gunpowder, all the food. He leaves it. 
some of the people, they're actually able to evacuate out. So some of these people who are Maroons, and again, by this point, it's, it's not just these men, it's, it's their families. It's people you know, bringing women and children in these communities. And they had literally built this community at the, the river there on the bluff, at Apalachicola. And so eventually they're, they actually get some people out. So some of these individuals end up going to Trinidad because it was a British colony. Some of them end up going all the way up to Nova Scotia, which again is a, is a British colony. Um, but they're not able to get everybody out. But it, it does grow. We know based on uh, records that we do have that at its height, it probably had close to 1,000 people living there just at the site of Prospect Bluff. But we also know that 50 miles up the river, there were also maroon communities that dotted the landscape all up and down the Apalachicola River. So it was, it was a pretty expansive uh, community. This is one of the artifacts that they actually found from Prospect Bluff. This is a, this is a view from the river looking at the, from the bluff down into the river. This was taken right on that bluff, kind of where that redon was at. Basically, kind of if you was standing on that, that's where you would be looking down at the river. Um, but this is a pretty typical British type of pottery. Uh, and again, we know that these were colonial corps marines, so all the supplies that they had, uh, not just the armaments, but, but all the other stuff, um, things like ceramic plates and bowls and cups, all that was British manufactured because they were supplied by the British. But, uh, so we know based on artifacts like this that are found at the site that it must date to that, to that settlement. Um, over this next year, it just keeps growing. More and more people are coming. People are hearing about it. They know if they can get to the site of Prospect Bluff that they will have their freedom because there are a group, a large group of very well-trained Marines that are heavily armed that will protect them and them from being re-enslaved if they can just get there. So people keep flooding into this community. It keeps growing. Uh, this is one of an eyewitness um, who actually kind of was a, essentially a spy. He, he basically yeah, was once part of the community. And for some reason, he leaves and he goes and reports some of the activity to the Americans. Um, he says, Fort Apalachicola is situated on the east side of the river, Apalachicola, about 60 miles before the junction of the Chattahoochee and the Flint Rivers. The walls of the fort are made of timber filled in with dirt and about 13 feet thick through. The space within the walls is about 20 yards and squared. There's 250 black men armed with muskets commanded by a French man named Garçon. They are drilled and perform regular guard duty. So again, they are constantly trained. Why are they training? Anybody? Why are they keeping training? Yeah. They know it's coming. They, they, they know that they have to train and be ready. And so they're, they're training because they, they know that eventually there's going to be a force that's going to come and try to take the freedom from them that they've acquired through joining the British Colonial Corps. Now, is it still Spanish Florida? It is still Spanish Florida, yes, 100%. The Spanish don't really want them there either. But they don't act because Pensacola was was always kind of a, you know, borderland garrison, right? I mean, it always sort of was struggling. They just didn't have the resources to 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 deal with that on any military sense at all. So, it was kind of a in their minds, it was kind of a, a thorn in their side because obviously the Ameri they know the Americans don't want it there. They couldn't really do anything about it. But also at the same time, if they're causing problems for the Americans. You know, it's not really our problem, right? So they're they're kind of, but but ultimately the Spanish don't really want it there either. They just have to kind of tolerate it essentially because they can't really do anything about it because it's so well armed at this point. But yes, it is uh, it is Spanish territory up until 1821. So through the entire period that this uh, free black community existed from you know essentially 1814 to 1816, it was Spanish territory at the time. This is another one of the artifacts that they uncovered at the site of Prospect Bluff. This is an axe head. Uh, so we, you know, we know that they built this massive fortification with you know, this whole blockhouse and magazine um, and fort walls all around it, quite large. And of course, to, to, to build it, they mostly used the timber around that area. There's still lots of pine trees all around that area. I mean, it's a national, it's a national forest, so there are lots of trees even, even back then. And so this is one of the tools they would have used to clear out those uh, trees to build this fortification. 
Um, there's another statement we have from this guy. His name is Samuel, Samuel Jarvis. Uh, he also leaves a description of this community, and he talks about how concerned he is about how well armed these, these people are, these, these colonial corps marines. It says that among the articles delivered were, a can, were of cannon, four 12-pounders. Uh, they're called 12-pounders because the weight of the cannonball, the solid shot that was fired out of the cannon, weighed 12 pounds. So if that shot weighs 12 pounds, they just call it a 12-pounder. If it was six pounds, they'd call it a six-pounder. So that's what that means. One howitzer uh, and two co cohorns. Cohorns were basically like mortars. If you know what a mortar is, it was basically a mortar. About 3,000 stand of small arms. So those are rifles. Those are brown best rifles. And near 3,000 barrels of powder and ball. They were heavily armed. Again, they were armed as well because the British had planned to take Mobile and New Orleans. So that's why they had all the supplies. And then Nichols, because he didn't just want to leave these people hanging, left all the supplies. He had to take his, his, uh, his soldiers out, but he left them with the supplies he knew they would eventually need. This is another artifact they uncovered from the side of Prospect Bluff. Um, this is a bayonet. We know based on the style, archaeologists can actually look at the way it's designed, and we know that comes from a Brown Bess bayonet uh, dating from the early 1800s. It was pretty much standard British issue, something that the Colonial Corps Marines would have had and used. Um, so again, we, we were lots of material culture associated with the settlement, and we know that because of the types of material cultures and artifacts that have been found at the site. Eventually, though, um, what they always knew would come eventually comes. Um, and by um, the early 1816, um, Jackson, General Andrew Jackson, orders one of his commanders, General Gaines, to essentially insta instigate a conflict with the fort at Prospect Bluff. The Americans are referring to this fortification now as Negro Fort. That's not what the people in the community called it. That is what the Americans called it. Today, the site, when we refer to it, we refer to it as Prospect Bluff. Um, it's known as Prospect Bluff Historic Sites. That's, that's its official name. Um, but this is what the Americans called it. Um, so he, ins he sends General Gaines to basically, because again, this is Spanish territory. So he wants to send his boats up and down the river, hoping that the uh, defenders at Prospect Bluff will get nervous and start firing shots. And that will then give them justification to destroy the fortification and then re-enslave everyone there and then try to get them back to what, who they saw as their, um, their owners, their enslavers. That's, that was the plan. Uh, US, this was not just an army operation. Actually, the, there was naval ships used in this operation. Um, they also had some of those Lower Creek allies who had er earlier fought with the, with the Upper Creeks during the Creek Civil War. They arrive in July of 1816 under this guy, Colonel uh, Duncan Clinch, who later on fights in many of the, the, what we refer to as the Seminole Wars uh, later on in Florida. Um, essentially, they surround the fort fortification. At this point, uh, Jackson has thousands of men. The fortification, by, by this time, as far as we know, had a little under 300 people there. Most of those are women and children. There's probably about 80 fighting men at the fortification. So the, the odds are stacked against them. Um, Jackson, uh, or General Clinch, uh, orders them to surrender. And Garcon, in response, says no. And then he raises the British ensign and the red flag. And the reason why he raised that flag is because he was saying, we are core colonial Marines. And the red flag means that they would not surrender. There would be no quarter. They were, they were there to fight for their lives, for their families, and for their freedom even if that meant death. That's, that's what they were saying, essentially. Remar this is a 3D recreation of what the fortification may have looked like. I mean, it's based on some historical accounts as well, some of the archaeology done there. Um, again, it's, we don't know exactly what it looked like, um, but this is, this is a, a, an interpretation of what it may have looked like, and that's why that flag's there. Um, the battle goes on for about a week, remarkably. Like, these, these 80 men and their, their wives and kids who are all pitching in 
to, to try to fend off these attackers are able to fight a whole week without the fort being taken. Um, this is uh, another artistic uh, creation by uh, Jackson Walker. And it's showing the, the battery at Prospect Bluff. These are some of the Maroon Colonial Marines. And eventually, the, the Americans actually send in, the Navy sends in some gunboats, gunboat 149 and 154. They're ordered to go up the Apalachicola River because they can't, they can't take the fort with just the Army. So what they want to do instead is they want to send gunboats up the river and then bombard it with artillery. And then hopefully that would soften it up. And then eventually they could then take the fort. That was the plan. Um, the defenders kept fi fighting back. They started firing cannon at these American ships that were approaching the river. Gunboat 154, under this guy, Captain Jarris Loomis, um, on board they had a uh, few gunboats were very small vessels. They, they weren't like these big warships, but they were usually armed with one or two small uh, cannon artillery. One of the cannonballs, they actually heated up in the stove. It was called hot shot. And the, the hope was that it would hit some wood and catch fire. Right? That's what they had hoped for. Gunboat, was, it was about a mile away. It fired one of the hot shot. It arced over the fort. And it just happened to land right in the powder magazine when the door was open. And the result was just catastrophic. 270, I'm sorry, 270 people who were at that fort, men, women, and children, died in that explosion. Um, there were some survivors, um, but there were very few of them. Most of the people died, and the battle just ended after that hot shot. It was just a lucky shot. I mean, if they tried to do that shot again, they probably couldn't recreate it. It was just a lucky shot, uh, unfortunately, for these people. This is what archaeologists believe to be one of the barrel bands to the gunpowder um, barrels. And so the powder magazine stored all the gunpowder in it for that, for that very reason they were hoping wouldn't happen, that did happen. And that was that if something like f that was on fire or hot got inside the powder magazine, it could cause this, this explosion that would destroy the whole fortification and community. And that is, that is unfortunately what happened. But this is that one of the barrel bands that was twisted. And, and they found these archaeologically. And we know that these were British uh, because some of these barrel bands actually had um, uh, the royal arrow on it, the broad arrow. And when we find objects with that little arrow symbol, it has a very distinctive meaning. It means it's the property of the crown. It means it's a royal crown property. So again, we know these barrels, where they came from, they came from the British. So we know that this must have been one of the barrel bands. Um, the scene was pretty horrific. Uh, like I said, there were some survivors. There's this guy, Dr. Marcus C. Buck. He was uh, with, actually, the 4th Regiment of Infantry who was there um, right after the explosion. So he went in and tried to give you know, aid to, to the people who were injured. Um, some of the people, many of the people were killed instantly. Uh, there were some survivors that had horrible wounds. Some of them later passed on. Some, some people did survive. Uh, but he has this whole account that he writes about it later in life in the 1830s that's published. He writes this letter to his father soon after the, con the, the battle, and he describes it in detail, and it's later published. And he says that you cannot conceive or describe the horrors of the scene. Um, it's just a very sad, uh, tragic event, um, certainly for these people, uh, but, but really just, just on, a, on a human level, it's, it's just pretty horrific. Um, Later on, so there, there are some survivors, uh, those people that are then captured, some of them are executed. Some of them are forced back into slavery. And they wind back in slavery. Colonel Daniel Patterson was uh, in New Orleans at the time. He was kind of the, the head person of the Navy in charge of this expedition. He writes a letter. He says, the English Union Jack and red are bloody flags under which they committed their unprovoked hostilities. Right? Against the American flag are in my possession, and I shall have the satisfaction of forwarding them to the department by the first safe conveyance. Right? He's saying, you know, it's unprovoked, right? And that's where we get back with these records. We know that 100% they were trying to provoke and to provoke this. They were instigating this. It was done on purpose. But in the official record, the 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 explanation is different. And that's why we have to be careful with historical records. And that's, again, why archaeology is such an important part of understanding our past. Um, 
Fortunately, some of the people who were at Prospect Bluff actually were able to get out before that battle happened. Some, uh, many of them ended up going to these seminal towns that were further to the east, and they started more maroon communities over there. But eventually, they were pushed further and further south. So the, the American under Jackson kept pushing, trying to uh, eradicate and re-enslave these people, and eventually they kept being pushed further and further south. Eventually, a group of them wound up uh, near the Manatee River, which is in um, South Florida. It's near, if you know where Bradenton or Sarasota is at, it's in that area. And they formed this, the survivors from Prospect Bluff, ended up down there. Eventually, in 1821, Florida becomes a U.S. territory, and Jackson keeps pushing, pushing people out. Uh, and eventually, that community, too, which, was, which we, we now would call Angola, is also destroyed. But the British were actually able to evacuate some of the people from Angola. And they wind up in, in the Bahamas. And that's where many of their descendants, who are directly, direct descendants of the people who originally established that community at Prospect Bluff, are still living today. Some of them have even been to Prospect Bluff pretty recently. So they're, you know, despite all this tragedy, despite the fact that these people kept on fighting for their freedom no matter what, under horrible conditions, it shows that despite all that, they were still resilient. They were still able to survive. They were still able to, to make something of it. And they were still able to ultimately find their freedom despite having to fight so hard for so many years for it. The site is eventually is renamed Fort Gadsden. Um, so the fort's destroyed. Uh, there's not much left of it anymore. So the Americans decide to build a new fortification, like Fort Morgan was built on. You know, they typically would just build forts on top of each other. Uh, this guy, James Gadsden, is in charge of building this new fortification. This is a map of it. So this is the newly constructed Fort Gadsden. And the larger fortification is the, the Maroon Marine one, the British post. So you can see how much bigger the original fortification was than the, the American one. That was a little bit later. Later on, Fort Gadsden is used in what some historians refer to as the First Seminole War. This is where the United States was trying to push the Seminole people out of Florida, um, push them out west eventually. Um, and many other uh, campaigns were actually launched from Fort Gadsden. So the Americans were launching their uh, attacks against Seminole villages, pushing them further and further south, until finally, you know, they, they're down in the Everglades, essentially, and they keep resisting, and eventually the Americans give up. And then that's, in fact, why we have the Seminole and the Miccosukee reservations down there today. It's not because they weren't up in North Florida. They, they had lived there for thousands of years. It's just they were kept being pushed further and further south. You know, this whole, the whole area of Florida was their traditional ha homelands. It's just that's, you know, they just kept being pushed. Um, so what, what happened to, to some of these survivors? We had talked about, I, I mentioned most of these people were re-enslaved, the survivors. Um, but we had mentioned some of these people. So we'll just kind of go through what happens to them. Uh, Garcon actually survives the battle. Uh, he's terribly wounded. Um, he is questioned probably tortured, and he's executed at the site. Josiah Francis, uh, he goes on. He, survi he actually survives as well. He wasn't there during the battle. Um, but eventually, he takes a British ship, and he goes to England. And he spends a couple years in England, and he's basically trying to get uh, the British crown to sign a treaty with the Upper Creeks of mutual security. That's what he's trying to do. He's like fighting for his people, but politically he's trying to re-ally the British with, with them. Uh, ultimately, it's not successful. He ends up going back to Florida after a year or so. Uh, and eventually, um, during this time that he comes back as a first Seminole War, eventually he is captured and he is ex he's also executed. He has a couple kids uh, that, that do survive, but, but he is killed as well. Abraham. Um, actually survives the battle, and he actually lives in the old age. Abraham goes on to become one of the most important figures during the Second Seminole War. And in fact, there are American observers that refer to him in the time period as the Talleyrand of the Seminoles. Talleyrand was a very influential French um, intellectual and revolutionary during the French Revolutionary War. 
So he's being compared to this guy who's seen as, you know, this very important figure in the revolution. Eventually, he, he fights against the Americans for many, many decades as, as they're being pushed further and further south. Uh, but eventually, in 1830, with the U Removal Act, uh, many of these people are eventually removed, including Abraham, to what is now Oklahoma. And one of the people whose job it was to, tr to forcibly remove these indigenous people from Florida was James Gadsden. So he, he played a role in that removal as well. But Abraham actually lives in a pretty old age. Then I came across this curious case. You know, I always thought, you know, most people either died or re, were re-enslaved. Um, but there's a few had, who had different outcomes. And this guy's one of them. His name's James Cook. And in the 1820s, there's this court case. I was actually looking um, through some court records uh, in, in Pensacola, there was actually a federal court in Pensacola, the West uh, District, Flor District Court of West Florida. Um, and it was established in 1821 when it became a territory. There's all these court cases there. And I was going through, flipping through these records, and I came across a reference to uh, Negro Fort. And I thought, what's, what's going on here? So I started reading through the case. And essentially what happens is there's this man named James Cook. And... He is uh, living with a group of indigenous people along the Escambia River uh, in 1816. And a group of uh, uh, enslavers raids the village, sees that he's there, and they, they say, oh, you're, you're a person of African descent. You must be an enslaved person. And so they try to enslave him. Eventually, he's able to actually prove that he was actually a free man. And so he's, he's let go. The, the court rules that he's free, he's let go. Then in, in later on in the 1820s, uh, the same thing happens to him again. Except that this lady, Euphalia Garcon, and she claims that uh, she, has, she owned him, that his, her family had owned him. And so he's once again kidnapped and thrown in the, the jail in, in, at West Florida, at the court of West Florida. And somehow he's able to actually... Um, get a lawyer, and, and claim that his rights of habeas corpus have been violated, that he's a free black man, that he not, was not enslaved. So there's this whole court case, because now this judge is like, okay, let's, let's figure out what's going on. Remarkably, all these witnesses come forward, six witnesses. Three of the witnesses that came forward that testified in court were enslaved people, and they all said the same thing. This is Peter Alba. This is his testimony. Peter Alba was the mayor of Pensacola, okay, at one point. He has known Joe. So it turns out his name was not James. His name was actually Joe Cook. James was just the alias he was using. He has known Joe in this place eight or nine years, and during that time he has always passed for a free man, and that he distinctly recalled having seen Joe in the year 1814, a soldier in the British Army in British uniform. This is one of, an, another person who testified, Joe Madrid. Saw Joe land at this place soon after the fort was blown up. That he has since that time he has known Joe and that he has always passed in this place for a free man. And this is one of the enslaved people. You know his name was Leon. He says, he first saw Joe on board a British vessel at St. Andrew's Bay on Century. And British soldiers said that he had always passed for a free man. So all these witnesses come forward and the judge rules. He was one of the core colonial marines, and they ruled that he was free. He had to keep fighting for his freedom despite the fact that these, these judges had ruled that he was free. I tried to find more information about Joe Cook after I found this. I didn't find much, but I found one entry in the 1860 census. A guy named Joe Cook, right there. Age, 106. Race, black place of birth, Africa. So this is 1860. This is a year before the American Civil War kicks off. Um, I don't know what happens to Joe if he lived to see the, the war happen or not. I, I, just, I don't know. After this, I can't really find any information on him. Um, but it's, it's really, it shows you again that, that resilience, that this man kept fighting for his freedom all the way through, even when it became an American territory, even after the war, just happening to keep fighting for it no matter what. Um, 
despite that, he's able to, to still survive. So um, I think, again, it just shows that resilience of, of these people who had, against all odds, kept fighting for their freedom. And unfortunately, most of them never obtained that. I'm going to go over some of the archaeology done. I know we're probably close on time. But before I get into the archaeology, I was at the site in, uh, I think, December, last December. And like I mentioned, we were working with a grad student who's hoping to do some research out there, looking at some of the underwater archaeology there on the river. And there really hasn't been much underwater archaeology done in that site. Um, and so we were, we were hoping to kind of connect her with some of the um, uh, forest rangers and managers out there, and they're very supportive of it. But we wanted to sh show her the site because she had never been there. So we pulled up to the site, and when we get there, um, we could tell something was wrong. And the uh, archaeologist who's with the Forest Service came out, and she said, you know, um, we're, we're probably not going to be able to do a full tour because um, last night a uh, metal detectorist came out to that site and dug 30 holes that site. Um, so with that said, before I get into the archaeology, I just want to point out that that's super illegal. Um, there's lots of federal laws. This is a national forest, so it is federal land. And federal lands and state lands are all protected. The, the archaeology, the history, the historic sites are all protected on state and federal lands. And it actually goes way back, right? The first federal law for um, uh, archaeology was actually passed in 1906, the Antiquities Act of 1906. There's Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979, and then it was amended in 1991. There's the Native American Graves and Protection Repatriation Act of 1990 that protects um, indigenous remains. And Florida Historical Resources Act, Chapter 267, uh, um, that protects archaeology on state lands, both state uh, submerged lands as well as lands. So that's anything underwater is actually protected. If it's navigable, any river that's navigable in the state of Florida, anything underwater is protected under state law. Um, and then, of course, there's a Florida uh, Human Burial Law, Chapter 872, that protects all human burials and remains and associated grave goods, um, regardless of how old they are, regardless of whether they're on public or private land, and regardless of cultural affiliation, they're protected. So um, the person that did this, uh, I don't know if it's been caught yet. I hope they do get caught. Because they, they're, they're looking at some pretty stiff penalties. But also, there's, there's the moral and ethical issue with it. We know that many people, indigenous people, people of African descent, died on this site. So it's just, in my opinion, pretty immoral to go and dig anything up. Um, and there, there are no plans for any archaeology to, to dig in this area at all. Uh, we're using non-invasive techniques. So one of some of the things that you've seen on the screen were actually excavated many, many decades ago. There's, there's no plan to actually excavate the site at all because of it, it, the fact that we know that there are human remains and burials there. With that said, though, so uh, since we are talking about the archaeology, the, the first archaeology was done in the 1950s. Um, and in fact, originally they were just trying to research Fort Gadsden. And then the archaeologists working there at the time kept finding these British artifacts, British armaments, bullets, uh, bayonets, pieces of rifles. And they, they started to research it, and they realized that there was actually an earlier settlement, and it was this maroon community that was there. So this actually turned out to be the very first archaeology done in the state of Florida on a marine community, on a marine, uh, I'm sorry, a, a maroon settlement, a free black settlement. Um, but it was. Uh, they didn't do major excavation. It was just like test units, so they weren't doing any major trenching or anything like that. So this is when they first identified it as this is the site of Prospect Bluff. Uh, about a decade later, they did actually do uh, several trenches. Uh, again, most of the archaeology, they were, fo they were focusing on that later American-built fort, Fort Gadsden. But a couple of, so they dug nine different trenches across the site to kind of see how the fort was constructed. Two of those trenches actually happened to go through right uh, where one of the walls to that blockhouse or powder magazine was located at. And what you're seeing here is some of those timbers that are actually still preserved underground. And so, um, you know, Florida generally, like the preservation isn't great, but in some conditions, if, if the conditions are just right, then things like Organic material like wood can actually be preserved for a really, really long time, especially if it's buried underwater. And then it can last 
hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Uh, but they also found uh, several hundred artifacts related to uh, uh, that earlier um, maroon community at Prospect Bluff. But the focus here, again, was just on the fort. They weren't looking at where most of the actual people were living in that community that surrounded it. Really, no major archaeology has been done in the actual village site to date. That sort of changes to some extent. In 2018, Hurricane Michael hits the panhandle as a Category 5 hurricane, decimates uh, the area. There's, um, they're still rebuilding in some communities like Mexico Beach and Panama City. They're still, uh, it's, it's getting there, but they're, they're, still, um, they're still doing some rebuilding there. One of the issues with Michael is, is um, you know, we're, we're usually, when hurricanes hit, for archaeologists, we're concerned about coastal sites because you get these massive storm surges that just cause really terrible erosion of sites. But we know from Michael that sites that were 60 miles inland were also impacted because essentially what happens is these trees are uprooted. And when those trees are pulled up from their roots, all that material that's buried underneath it comes out with it. And so in 2018, the Forest Service um, and the uh, National Park Service and some archaeologists with a private archaeology company actually did some salvage work out at the site where they were going through these massive root mats to try to recover any artifacts. And they did find quite a few uh, British um, artifacts that we know were probably associated with that uh, community, that maroon community. More recently, most again, the, the, there's, no, um, there's no plans to do any digging, again, because of the sensitive nature of it, because of different laws that we have, because you know, respecting the wishes of many of the uh, indigenous tribes that are, are directly connected to this site, as well as the descendant communities that still exist um, in the United States and in places like Trinidad and um, in the Bahamas. Um, they're doing more uh, geophysical surveys and non-invasive techniques. So you've probably seen stuff on TV with the ground penetrating radar. That's what this device is right here. But basically, this device is often used to try to locate uh, features underground, sometimes including things like burial shafts. So, so even if a um, grave marker is no longer there, using this device, we can actually see underneath the ground and get a good indication whether there's something there or not. And so they're, they're using this quite a bit. Uh, the Park Service has had a really good success using ground penetrating radar. Um, Jeff Shanks uh, and, and Don Lawrence with the uh, Forest Service in particular have done a lot of work. And they've actually been able to kind of figure out exactly how the, the original blockhouse was laid out just by using GPR. So they haven't had to dig at all. They can just use the GPR to figure that out. Um, another thing that they have used at the site, I guess, because we know so many people were, were killed at the site, they use, uh, they brought in cadaver, they're known as cadaver dogs. And so these dogs are trained to basically be able to smell human remains. And they've had success with using these dogs for sites that are thousands of years old and they're able to actually locate it. So they did use a cadaver dog at this site um, uh, a few years ago. They didn't have a lot of success with the cadaver dog. So it's, it's ter it turns out that they're having a lot more success with the ground penetrating radar than they are um, with the cadaver dogs. But the cadaver dogs can be very useful. It probably just depends on a lot of different factors. Um, all those images that you saw today, um, the reason why we had those is because uh, a couple years a couple years ago, we worked with the uh, National Forest Service um, because we, we wanted to create an exhibit um, to tell this story because there are so many of the people that ended up living in that community were actually originally from Pensacola, and a few of them were actually originally from Mobile as well. So, the, so the, some of those enslaved people who ended up at Prospect Bluff were originally enslaved in Pensacola and Mobile. So the, there was that connection that we had to the site. Um, so the Park Service, they, they really wanted to help tell this, inst this story of this site. Um, it's already a national historical landmark, which you know there's only 700 or so of those in the United States. And it's also one of the few sites in Florida that are listed on the uh, Underground Network to Freedom Trail sites. So it's, it's got national significance for sure. So we wanted, they wanted to tell that story more, and we were able to, to help them do that by creating this exhibit. But we also, as part of that, some of the artifacts that we used uh, for the exhibit, uh, we had some of our FPAN staff. Uh, this is Emma Dietrich and Nicole Grenon and Jeffrey Robinson. Um, they basically took cameras, and they took a whole bunch of pictures of artifacts from different angles. And then what we can do is we can put those uh, photos through a computer program, and then it can turn those photographs into a 3D model that's to scale 
down to the millimeter. So it's incredibly accurate. If you're interested in some uh, the models that we created for this exhibit, you can just go to our page, sketchfab.com slash fpan. It has all of our 3D models on it, including stuff we created specifically for Prospect Bluff. This is one of those mo models that we created. Again, you can find these online. If people want to print them out, they, they can if they want to print them out. Um, this is what the site looks like. Um, I, would, I would say that this is not today. This is actually taken in 2018. So this is before Hurricane Michael. But uh, the, the site eventually um, was reopened. I think they've since had to close it down again because of that incident of looting, partially. Um, and also, they're, they're looking to have more on-site management there as well. Um, but, but it is a place that, um, you know, go on their website. You can see eventually they, they will be open. I think for, for a while they were talking about just having it open like every, you know, once a month on a Saturday. But if you go to their website, you can find out when they're actually open. But it is in the National Forest, um, and it is uh, a very unique and special place that deserves respect and certainly deserves the preservation. This is a map from Google Earth showing here's the, the river. This is Apalachicola River. You can see right here the outline. This is the earthworks that were created for the smaller fort, Fort Gadsden. So again, just to kind of give you an idea of how big this place was. All right, so it's hard to kind of see the, the other larger fort from this image. And so that's why we can use other technologies like LIDAR, which you've probably heard from if you've been following archaeology in Central America. They use this equipment to basically penetrate tree canopy to see what's underneath it. So a lot of these ancient Mayan cities and ruins and road network systems that are covered up by jungle, dense jungle and vegetation, they can actually use this, this device to penetrate through all that and see what's there. And so this is using LIDAR data right here. You see very clearly Fort Gadsden. And then you see the outline of the earlier uh, fortification at Prospect Bluff. This big indentation is where that explosion happened. This is the blockhouse and the powder magazine. So it's, it's still there on the landscape. If you, if you go to the site, if you ever had a chance to visit the site, you can still see it on the landscape today. And this is just kind of turned so you can see from a different angle. But yes, the site is uh, still very much there and preserved. And as long as um, people aren't going out there and, and looting, then that story of these people who were not able to leave behind the same sort of written records that some of the people who didn't want them there were, will hopefully be able to tell more and more of that story. Um, we also created eventually this exhibit. It's actually on display now. If you go to the city of Apalachicola, uh, it's, it's at the um, Apalachicola Arts and Cultural and History Center. It's right on Water Street, so it's there right now, including some of the 3D models that we've created for it. Um, and so it's there. But also, we have an online version of it that you can check out online if you want to do that as well. And it's just on our website, Destination Archaeology. There's so much more. <laughs> I know I've come way over time. But there's so much more to this story. So I really encourage everybody to please go out and read all these different books. There's lots of them out. There's lots of articles. These are the ones that I, I relied on for the most part, for most of the information in this talk. I've done some little bit of research on my own, but I would recommend any of these. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to Dr. Matt Clavin. You know, I was a product of you know Florida educational system. I, I've, I grew up, you know, I was a military brat, so I moved around a lot until I was about 10, and then I've been in the Panhandle since then for, for about 30 years. So I went through elementary school, middle school, high school. I never heard of this site, and I only live a few hours away. It wasn't until I took an undergraduate course, history course called Africa and Africans in the Atlantic World with a, uh, Dr. Matt Clavin that I first heard of this site. That was in 2004. And fortunately, since that time, I've been able to visit that site many different times uh, for different projects. Um, but this is a great, you know, if, if you want to get like the kind of condensed version of what happened, this is a great resource. But really, any of these books, especially, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Dr. Rosalind Howard, Black Seminoles, she's the reason why some of the descendants in the Bahamas know about this place now. It's because of her work. So please check out any of these books. They're fantastic. And they, they um, really do justice to the importance that this site has to tell us about our past. And I think um, that really, you know, it, sh it shouldn't take uh, a, a student who's going through our educational system until they're in college in a specialized course to learn about this site in particular. I, I think it's something that we, we should all know because it is incredibly important and significant. Um, 
And then, of course, I, there's lots of people to acknowledge who have done lots of different work on this project with the exhibit um, and just the research in general and the archaeology. And then if you ever want to get involved with any of our programs, we have lots of different opportunities. I mean, we're only in an hour or so from you all. So if you're ever in uh, Pensacola, please, again, stop by our museum. But we have lots of different programs and projects from citizen science stuff to cemetery resources and workshops and trainings. Uh, the best way to find that information is just go to our website, fpan.us, and you can find it there. We also have social media, so you can follow us on there. And again, uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you so much.